So then, what makes the people held at Guantanamo any different from those held in supermax prisons across the United States? And does the U.S. government owe anything to those who were wrongfully detained? To discuss, I'm joined by retired Colonel Michael Baumgartner, who served as the commander of the prison at Guantanamo Bay in 2005 and 2006. This is the first television interview given by Colonel Baumgartner since he retired from the military in 2010. Colonel, while you were in charge at Guantanamo, Mohamedou Salahi was one of the highest value detainees. That's how he was considered. He'd been apprehended, picked up in Senegal in January of 2000. He was taken to Mauritania where he was held in custody under surveillance for a couple of years. He was accused, among other things, of being a recruiter for the 9-11 hijackers. Several governments, including the German, the Mauritanian, the Canadian, warned the CIA that they did not have the man they thought they did, that he was the wrong person. Yet he spent more than 14 years in detention at Guantanamo. Does that now, did that then make any sense to you? Well, from what Mr. Slahi says and what I know, I'm not that much of an expert in the intelligence realm, but I do know that we treated him very differently. Uh, he was handled very differently. Uh, but that was because of the amount of information he was providing. What do you mean he was treated very differently? You just heard him say that he was subjected to some extreme uh, oh, techniques uh, that many people would regard as torture, extreme temperatures, sleep deprivation, force yeah. feeding, yeah. and the rest of it. Yeah, I can answer each one of those. Uh, but really what he was treated during my time there, and I, and I imagine throughout, was actually very good living conditions, a separate facility that was his little house. Uh, so he was, it was totally uh, very well controlled. But does being in solitary confinement be, mean being in a very good condition? Well, he was, he was separate. It was administrative SAG. Uh, he, of course, could see his attorneys there. Uh, and across the way, there was another individual uh, that he could speak with. Uh, but it really, I think he agreed with wanting to be there because of the information he was providing. He did not want to be in the normal population. That's, that was the way I saw it and understood it at the time. Well, but, well we're not able to put this question to him now, but yeah. one would imagine that he would uh, vehemently disagree. Yeah. What would you say to him today, though? Do you believe, do you think that the U.S. government owes him, at the very least, an apology, maybe some form of compensation, for not just wrongfully detaining him all these years, but for subjecting him to these extreme measures that amount to torture? Uh, the measures that you speak of would have been prior to my time arriving. And there, there were uh, instances where there was sleep deprivation where we moved individuals um, and other techniques used by intelligence agencies. Um, the extreme temperatures was a common complaint, but it really was no more than the air conditioning in the facilities that was set to the temperature that was very comfortable, 65, 68 degrees in a very humid, hot environment. Um, and that was a common, common complaint from everybody. It's too cold or too hot. Well, common uh, complaint, but I mean, the Geneva Conventions are very clear about uh, the standards of international law that need to be upheld in the humanitarian treatment of prisoners of war. You yourself apparently were brought there to uphold some of these standards. Prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated. Yes. According to the convention. Do you yes. believe that they were? During my tenure, I absolutely think they were. I did everything I could to improve their living conditions. And I know the Department of Defense continued on uh, for as far as I know with the programs that I put in place. Not all the conventions of Article Three really apply. I mean, you just cannot do them in that environment at the time. Perhaps now you can, as time has gone on. Uh, as an example, to provide them all instruments, musical instruments, or to science, equipment. That's part of Geneva uh, Article 3. So there's a lot of things, and I could just go on and on, but there's a lot of things that people say give them all Article 3. There, I have, I have for many years felt that the Geneva Conventions, you just cannot apply it. I don't know how to do it, but the conventions need to be modified for the war on terrorism. You said that Mohamedou was treated differently to others because he provided valuable information. Mm -hmm. What kind of valuable information did he provide? I would, I would be deep into classified information if I told that. I wish I could share it. Uh, I'm not the declassification authority, and perhaps it is now, uh, but the information that I know was very significant, uh, very significant information. 
and I wish I could share it, but... Why wasn't he released earlier, though? I mean, he was eventually let go by the periodic review board that mm -hmm. were instituted under President Obama. Uh, again, the question is, does the U.S. today owe him an apology or some form of compensation? I would... I don't believe in the uh, uh, compensation and an apology. I, I suppose I am convinced that Mr. Slahi had done some things that called his detention. I do not believe that he is as pure as he says. Uh, I am not a court of law. I have not seen all the information, you know, his side of the story. I haven't studied his case fully, but what I knew at the time and what I knew was ongoing at the time, I was convinced that he was being rightfully detained. But he obviously wouldn't have been let go if he had been. No, please and understand and the Periodic Review Board is not exactly the intelligence agency. I mean, there are so many things. The Periodic Review Board is more of a judicial type body that looks at it. But it I mean, so it's not the military working together saying, oh, okay, he's now ready to go. I think there probably were people in the intelligence world and probably others who would say, no, he shouldn't be released. But, I but don't know that for fact. But, but he's not the only one. Issue. He's, he's oh, not no, the only no, one. Yeah, uh, Mohammed is one of many detainees yeah. who were actually mm -hmm. um, rendered, in other words, kidnapped by the CIA, not on the battlefields in Afghanistan. In fact, less than 5% of detainees were taken from the battlefields in Afghanistan. In this case, he was in Senegal. So it goes counter to the whole narrative of what Guantanamo Bay is about which is capturing yeah, I, prisoners I'm not of sure war. about that 5% where but that it, came from. These, are, these <laughs> are the statistics that are out there. Less than 5% of detainees, actually, detainees who were captured on the battlefields in Afghanistan. That but certainly the vast doesn't, majority that does not them, match the intelligence reports I've read. The vast majority of them, though, were handed over to the CIA, either by competing warlords in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, elsewhere, or even by let's say neighbors who had a grievance against these men, perhaps, against uh, against very handsome uh, bounties, so for, for an important amount of money, thousands of dollars. Are you ready to accept, though, that the vast majority of the men who were at Guantanamo since the beginning, who are there now, are innocent? No, I don't believe that. Why haven't f they faced any charges then? There's at least 23 among the ones who remain there, among the 40, who haven't faced any charges. Yes. The case gets very complicated in that it is very difficult to take an individual that you took off the battlefield or you took somewhere and build a case as opposed to I am investigating an event and I build criminal evidence. It is contrary to normal how the criminal justice process works and there's a significant amount of classified information. I know that the commissions are allowed under certain provisions to introduce that but it's very difficult to get all the information into the case and in to the court. But do you believe there's any form of justice in the military commission system at Guantanamo? I think that the commissions, the, I do believe in them. Uh, I know the great extent our defense attorneys go to. I mean, they are deeply committed, the, even the military ones that I speak of now, they are deeply committed to ensuring justice. But let's just look at the facts. Just eight convictions, six of them obtained through plea deals, three of these convictions completely overturned, one of them partially overturned. In fact, today there's only been one finalized conviction in 18 years. Yes, I, I, is this your definition of justice? It is not my definition of justice, but when you say overturned, I would really, I have not studied them, but I'd like to know w what point was it overturned? What was the point on which it, the overturn? It, was it, was it, they, it's not saying they aren't guilty. But regardless but it was of overturned. that, but just looking at the numbers, just eight convictions, six of them obtained through plea deals, most of them overturned, one of them standing. Yeah, well, in regard to statistics, do you have the numbers of those who were, have returned to the battlefield, that have been released, that we repatriated to their home countries? But that is not the question. The question is what kind of justice but are these people afforded I, see, in I these military it, commissions? I, you look through it as a lens, and I don't mean it argumentative, but your lens is that of justice, mine is that of security, national security. But President Obama himself said this in 2009. He says, rather than keeping us safer, the prison at Guantanamo has weakened American national security. I strongly disagree with that. You disagree with him. Strongly and disagree. And you disagree with his then Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, when she says uh, it has actually inspired more terrorists yeah, than I it has imprisoned. I disagree with that. 
I, I so, think so what you, do you see I, as I the mean, achievement provide, of Guantanamo Bay after all these years? I think that it did keep people off the battlefield, that we held people who were dangerous to the world. I think that it, I mean, if you really study those 40 individuals, now I'll take, there's five that should be released right now. They should be repatriated. Uh, but nobody will take them. I mean, it's just, it's just a matter of issues, logistics. I think if you study those cases, you will find that there, there are some very bad actors within that group. Now, do I admit that yes, there are some innocent people probably picked up? I would agree with that. That probably is the case. But I would say to you that in the whole, there was a, there was a link to Al-Qaeda or I won't go to ISIS, certainly not. They didn't exist when we brought those in. But even if there was, why not try them then in federal courts? In fact, just recently, over the last few years, Bin Laden's son-in-law was convicted in a Manhattan federal court for pro providing well, material support to Al-Qaeda. And federal courts, in fact, have convicted more than 660 people compared to the well, eight convictions at Guantanamo. I think it depends on how you look at them. Are they criminals? Are terrorists taken in? Are they criminals? Or are they unlawful enemy combatants? Well, we're As talking Secretary about Rumsfeld said. Well, no, hold on. We're talking about 660 convictions in federal courts in terrorism-related cases. Are those domestic terrorism cases conducted by the FBI? I think most That's of them are. That's for the FBI to decide, but nonetheless, yes. they are terrorism cases. You've, it, got, you've got very, very uh, well-known cases as well. The shoe bomber, Richard Reed, Ramzi Youssef, who was allegedly yes. involved in the 1993 yes. World Trade Center bomb plot. The Times Square bomber, Faisal Shahzadi, and many others have all been convicted in federal courts. Exactly. Courses. Those are domestic terrorist cases. Quite different than an international case where you have collected them or have taken them from another atmosphere, another environment, where you have to go back to what I'm but saying. But that's being about. very selective. What about the Benghazi attackers? They're being, they're being tried in federal courts, aren't they? That was a very specific attack we knew about. FBI forensics did go in. They investigated that attack. We were dealing with individuals that were collected that we have to bring in other intelligence and say, yeah, he was with me when we did X. We didn't know that crime existed at the time. We didn't know that, you know, People were lined up inside of a uh, stadium and murdered. But what is the, the ultimate goal? Isn't it to bring these cases to trial? Because it seems that there has been legal roadblock after legal roadblock, including administrative roadblocks that have been erected in the face of these trials. Will they ever go to court? What would you like to see? I don't, I don't think they will. And why won't that they? That is just my personal belief, but it is somewhat informed through my reading since I've left. There's a, the group of what I would say about 25 of them that have strong intelligence information that the government is not in a position to take to court. Uh, and, and this really is open source information. Is it because the government doesn't have enough evidence against these people? Enough evidence that you could take into a court under rules of evidence that we could use. So evidence that would stand in a court of law, because as we know, evidence that has been garnered under interrogation techniques that amount to torture no. cannot be cannot be admitted yeah I don't, I don't in the a, information in that, I, that I would be talking about I do not see that as being taken through interrogation techniques the exceptional methods I don't see it as that at all there are other circumstances that remain classified that are just difficult to get into course to courts so those 25 I again it's, it's very hard to ask someone to say put confidence in these periodic review boards. I mean, if you don't know them, but they look as hard as they can at the case with as clear-eyed as they possibly can. So it's very hard just to ask you to believe in that and have faith in that. But, 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 but knowing as you do, and you said it earlier, you think some of these men, at the very least, are innocent, that they've been held unfairly. Yeah. Well, do, you, do you then disagree with President Trump for wanting to keep this facility open and, in his words, wanting to send in all the bad dudes. dudes yeah. I, you know, I've heard that, well, actually I read recently that he's re-looking at that, considering the expense of it, and I think that's his real measure. Well, it's cost more than $6 billion since 2002. Yeah, I, as I just read recently, I think it was like $13 million a year for each. So, but the, but the point to it, my personal belief about closing Guantanamo, if, you are, if we are not, as a nation, are not going to use it to house terrorists that are being picked up now and brought in, as an example, the Syrians. If we're not using it for that, there probably is a more efficient way 
However, it goes back to what Secretary Rumsfeld said. It is probably the best of the worst possibilities. I'll ask, I mean... Why does it remain open in your view? Uh, many reasons. Many, many reasons. Uh, one of them, you know, <laughs> every time we go to move those prisoners to the United States, and when it was tried before Congress said, no, you're not going to do it, there are certain, certain politicians said, yes, you can bring them here. But then when it came time to do it, uh, such as Senator Durbin, when we bought the facility in uh, Illinois, he all of a sudden, no, <laughs> we don't want them here. Same thing with New York City. Senator Schumer did not want them. Uh, he was quite happy to bring them into the New York until, or excuse me, to the United States until he found out they were in New York. So what you're saying is there is no legally compelling case to keep it open. This is all being done for political purposes. No, no. I think in part the legal case, and I, in all candor, I think the, there are certain protections certainly the Supreme Court has already ruled upon. Habeas corpus, corpus has been ruled. Yes, it exists. But I will say that the, and it's, if I may, I'd go back to, to the very beginning point. As a government, do you see these individuals as criminals or as unlawful enemy combatants? Should they be held under the law of war or are they being held under criminal law? But why should someone who was picked up in the streets of Senegal be held under the, the laws of war? You would, I would have to look very close at each case, but I know the gentleman you're now referring to, that is not consistent with the information that I know that he provided. Well, there were many, not just him, who were essentially kidnapped by the CIA on the streets of many capitals around the world. They were not picked up on the battlefields in Afghanistan. I don't, Therefore, yeah, do they yeah. fit that bill of being I, I, I enemy I certainly combatants. cannot speak for the CIA. I certainly cannot speak for them. But this is the vast majority of the I detainees. I would not agree with that character. There's only five of them today in Guantanamo who are held there on charges relating yes. to 9-11. Yes, 9-11, but after that, I mean, it, you know that we applied uh, greater expansion for the use of force, military use of force throughout the United States. So I don't think, you know, that characterization is a fair characterization. If you're looking just for the 9-11, you know, a quick tie to that, you're probably right. There are only five there. Let me ask you about your time in charge of the Joint Detention Group at Guantanamo, mm -hmm. when three inmates who had been hunger stri striking yes. were said to have committed suicide in their cells. Now the story is this. In 2010, a whistleblower, a Navy guard, came forward to say that the details of the official narrative that you and others at the detention facility put forward just simply did not add up. Mm -hmm. This guard, along with the testimony of three other guards, who were on active duty the night these three men were said to have committed suicide, uh, say that there might have been a cover-up. Under your watch, the bodies, they concluded, came from a CIA black site at Guantanamo. The evidence, they say, points to homicides and not suicides. What do you say? Absolutely not. I managed where each individual was located personally. I mean, my staff worked it, but I know those individuals were on that cell block. There is no doubt. I showed up in the camp as they were in our treatment facility, less than 20 meters from where the cell, their cell block was. Uh, I will admit, uh, this is much like this recent case with Epstein, had we been conducting business correctly on the tier, and had I not done certain things of being so generous in certain ways, the suicides would not have occurred. But I. But, but you say suicides. Move, to move an individual in that camp, there was great scrutiny at various levels for any movement that occurred. And it was picked up by these four Navy guards who were on duty. Why should three men who were about to be released, who were slated to be released and returned to their home they countries, didn't know that at the time. and who were never charged with a crime, why they would they, why would they, they take their released. own lives? Yeah. They did not know they were about to be released. The reason why they took their lives, and I will tell you, uh, Shakur Amir, 239, I don't, if you know my history, he and I worked together in an in a, in a early part of hunger strikes to try to relieve those hunger strikes. Shakur told me at that point, and Shakur was one of two of the key leaders within the camp, he's the last Brit that was released. Shakur told me that he had a vision that three men must die. And we knew this, three men must die, and when that happened, they will be allowed to go out. That night in the camp, not widely publicized, but 
when it opened reporting, there was a call to prayer being conducted separately in that camp, a death chant. And I kicked myself for not being in that camp that night because I would have picked up on it and known it. So I, I would destroy, to tell you how that movement would have taken place and how many guards would have known as irregular, you don't move in and out. I will, I will tell you this. But how did three men who were confined to their cells that were searched every 10 minutes? No, every, no. That were, no. They were searched every 10 to 20 minutes? No. No? How often no. were they searched? When you say searched. How often were they searched? Visually the, searched? Yeah. The visual search is I right. see skin, I see that's the human, and I'm supposed to see movement. All right. I will tell you, we failed there. Were these cells visually searched every 10 minutes or not? They were supposed to be. Well, they were supposed so how do you to be. explain that these men who had no motives committed suicide? How, did they have the means yes, to commit suicide? Absolutely. Just how? Absolutely. They took the extra bed sheet that I had given them across the board. I gave them extra bed sheet. You would think that's not a big deal. They took that bed sheet and they wove it into a noose. Well, we're told bed sheets and T-shirts. The report, uh, you know, the report by the NCIS, the Navy Investigative Unit, claimed the prisoners, as you say, hung themselves with torn sheets and T-shirts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't explain where they were able to get so much fabric from. Now you're saying that yeah. you provided it yes, to them the beyond board. their allotment. Part of it you know, is the tension of give them more, make their life better. They asked for another bed sheet so they could cover themselves. I mean, you know, but they they're being to subjected the to extreme heat and cold, and yet you're concerned about making their lives better and giving as them much extra as I could. blankets. For, I mean, you've seen or you've probably have read what I did in regards to their uh, diet, what I did to, re to respect their religion, uh, such as prayer call and things, uh, time, well, even giving them time. There's tons of things They were force-fed under your watch with nasal Absolutely. tubes and the rest of yes. it. And, and then you've got to go to a very important well, matter. And, uh, Right. Do, you, do you feel that a man should be allowed to kill himself in front of you? It's a moral question, and I ask myself constantly, and I know the doctors did. Are we okay with letting a man kill himself right before our eyes? I said no. I said no. My general said no. What? We are not going to allow them to kill themselves. That's what we fought hard to do. So, so, but do but not you, let them kill themselves. But it does still sound like a cover-up, doesn't it? Because, no. Because why then, why then were the bodies of these men, according to a human, human rights lawyer and journalist who conducted a, an investigation and published a piece. Are you talking about Harper's piece? Why, why did these men then show signs of torture, including hemorrhages, needle marks, and significant bruisings? And beyond that, why were the men's neck organs removed? I cannot speak to what the uh, pathologist did afterwards. But doesn't that strike you as, as very odd, to say the least? Something that would not help a person determine whether they died by hanging or strangulation? That, that which I can speak to clearly, 100%, without any doubt, without any doubt, if I could divulge to you two pieces of information that are classified, and I'm so, I really wish they weren't. I wish they were declassified. I could convince you beyond a reasonable doubt that they did this on their own. Do you know that cell block that they were on, that was constituted. I made another mistake. And I will admit I made a mistake. I put all the leaders on one block. I put all the leaders on one block, thinking that it might be better to get them out of the camps, put them there. By doing that, they were able to provide that moral support and you know guidance let's go ahead and do this this is where we'll do it had i kept them broken apart that probably would not have occurred i thought i was being a genius i'll just have one camp i'll just have one cell block that's bad as opposed to a full camp of a bad cell block um so there, there's a piece there that i wish i could tell you but there's no way I can ask you to, to say, trust me. But what can you tell us to make it more believable that these three men committed simultaneous mm -hmm. suicides under well, such uh, typed watch? On that tier that evening, I had maybe 15 minutes before uh, NCIS arrived. And at that point, I could not ask any further questions. Once NCIS arrived, which, you know, was my call, I said immediately contact NCIS to conduct the investigation. So I was quickly trying to determine what went on, what's happening on that. There was some tension amongst the guards that I think if you read through the NCIS report, you'll find it. There were some things uh, not being done according to standard. 
that led, and they took, <laughs> they took great advantage of us. They took great advantage of us, as, as an example. Should anyone have been disciplined, though? You lost your job as a result after this report came out. I, I was suspended and returned back to duty. I no, was one, no one was disciplined? Uh, the individuals that were on that tier, I left that assignment in July, just like three weeks after, and it had not been completed. Uh, non-judicial punishment. So just looking completed. at it now, looking back at these incidents, what goes through your mind? Do you believe that this detention center, as Physicians for Human Rights has called it, is a symbol of U.S. torture and injustice known around the world and something should be done mm. to, to, to change it, to close it, to rectify whatever wrongs it's been I accused of? One, I do not believe that it's a symbol of torture. People may imagine it to be torture, but I can, since 2005 when I arrived, there's no torture in that camp. You obviously have no problem with force feeding. In fact, there was a case involving more than 100 detainees in 2005 when you were at Guantanamo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with detainees hunger striking because of uh, what they say was abuse that they had witnessed after one of their colleagues, one of their de co-detainees had been brought back from interrogation. Uh, you saw it as a very simple and ethical moral issue. In fact, you even advised the Israeli government wants to force feed without reservations Palestinian detainees. Is it not a form of torture though? No, absolutely not. Again, I, I say to you, do you take the alternative to allow a man to kill himself in front of you or do you keep him alive? Know that it was doctors and nurses, licensed practitioners and, and RNs administering the feeding tube. But how can you the say that? How can you say that though? when yeah. the World Medical Association condemns force feeding and says it is unethical for a doctor to participate in force feeding. I mean, you seem to just call it, in its euphemism, assisted feeding, as if it's a favor you were almost doing to and these, to these detainees. We but did clearly, everything we clearly, could to, in, to encourage them to come off. Clearly there's a, an unethical medical dimension to it, no, which I you seem to ignore. So. I, I think it's a clear disagreement. I think you could poll the United States if that matters, or poll the world. Do you allow a man to kill himself in front of you? We didn't allow men to cut their wrist in front of us. I mean, we fought hard. I can recall times, man bleeding out, and our doctors are rushing to the scene, trying to sew this guy up. So you're and saying they did. your doctors were present while this was taking oh, place? Oh, yes, absolutely. This was overseen by our medical doctors. This, the Surgeon General of the Navy, was deeply involved in the decision. I mean, there were great ethical decisions made all the way up through the Department of Defense on this, to feed or not to feed. I mean, and it was, it, we're not going to let one die. We did not want anyone to die on our watch. Yet and at least three detainees died. And I failed. That, under your watch. I mean, Any I regrets? Hope, what are your regrets? My regrets is those three people were able to kill themselves. That I couldn't stop it. That I didn't stop it. I failed. Was it criminal what I did? No. I mean, I certainly didn't encourage it and no means was anybody involved actively in it. It was measures that I had taken that had loosened up the tear, that had given them too much liberty. They used it against me. I so you're saying you did not facilitate absolutely these not. Uh, suicides? That, they were You suicides. say there was no cover-up? Absolutely no cover-up. None, zero, not. There is no, if you knew the method in which we dealt with any other agency in the levels of supervision that dealt with any movement involving any agency outside of the joint detention group in the movement of an individual and the clearance that took, you would understand clearly that there's no way what was told is anywhere close to the truth. Colonel Baumgartner, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you.